We're living in a time that is unprecedented in American history. We are living in a time that there are more false teachers abounding than there has ever been in our nation's history. I think there are probably four reasons that we find that to be true. The first reason is that we have drifted away from the authority of God's Word. A hundred years ago, in this nation, even people who did not claim to be Christians still believed the Bible was God's Word, and they accepted the authority of Scripture. And they would have rejected immediately any teaching that was contrary to the teaching of God's Word. The second reason is because of the general ignorance of God's Word among our society. In the founding days of this nation, the children were educated with McGuffey's readers. McGuffey's readers were steeped in the Scriptures. They would learn the alphabet according to Scriptures. A, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They would read biblical truth and learn to read understanding biblical truth. But what we have now is a general ignorance of God's Word. And whereas they would have quickly recognized this teaching doesn't line up with God's Word, in our day, many do not know God's Word well enough to realize that a teaching does not line up with Scripture. The third reason is the abundance of streaming media. Never in human history has there been such an abundance of streaming media, such an availability to get a message out, no matter what that message might be. Man, you have the radio, you have the television, and you have the internet, you have YouTube, you have Twitter, uh, you have uh, Instant Message, you have Instagram, you have Facebook. I mean, there are just texting messages. There are just innumerable ways of spreading your message. Plus, now you don't even have to publish a book in paper. You can digitally publish online at almost no expense at all. And so again, there is this proliferation of materials that is out there as never before. And then the fourth reason, I believe, that there's abundance of false teachers is that we are approaching the end times. And the scripture says, as we approach the nearness of Christ's return, we can expect to see an increased amount, an increased activity of false teaching. Now, because we live in such a day that there are many false teachers, the book of Jude is very relevant to us. So take your Bibles, turn over to the book of Jude, which is that very small book. It's only one chapter, 25 verses. It comes right before Revelation. So go all the way to the end of your Bible, to the book of Revelation, and work your way back, and you will find Jude. Jude was writing to Christians as we are, and he was telling them that they had to contend for the faith. He says to them there in verse 3, Beloved, I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation. I felt necess a necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith. You see the Two words, contend earnestly. Now in the Greek, that's only one word. And it's the only time this word is used in the entire New Testament. It's the word which means contest, which means fight. We get our English word agony from this word. And Jude, led by the Holy Spirit, takes that word and adds a prefix to it to intensify it. So it's translated not just contend, but earnestly contend for the faith. And we are called as Christians to 
earnestly fight for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. The faith is the corpus of Christian doctrine that we have in the Bible. The truth of God as given in His Word that has been accepted by the church from the early centuries of church history. We have a body of truth, a body of doctrine that's called the faith. And we are to contend with this truth against those who would pervert it, those who would deny it, those who would distort it. Now, let's stand as I read for you verses 1 through 4, and our focal verse is verse 4 today. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Now we saw last week that we must know the army of God. Verse 1 tells us that. Our commander in chief is none other than Jesus Christ himself, the sovereign Lord. And we Christians are the soldiers, and we are secure in our salvation. He calls us those who are called, beloved, and kept, as well as those who are blessed in verse 2. May mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity, he was compelled, he was pressed by the Holy Spirit, he was burdened to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who alone beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the truth of God into licentiousness and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. You may be seated. <clears throat> we saw last week that the first step in contending, earnestly fighting for the faith, was to know who we are. We are the army of God, those who've been called, those who have, are beloved, those who are kept, and those who are blessed. The second step is we must know the enemy. We must know the false teachers. As I study this book of Jude and other books of the Bible about false teachers, there are three characteristics that keep showing up over and over again that help us to identify false teachers. Jude, in this small book, several times gives these false three characteristics that will help us identify false teachers. And today, we're going to look at these three characteristics. The telltale signs, the earmark characteristics of false teachers. Number one, they disbelieve God's Word. False teachers disbelieve God's Word. And we see that in verse 4, at the end of the verse, when it says, And deny our only Master and Lord Jesus Christ. Now this disbelief of God's Word takes on three forms. The first one is they outright reject the Bible as God's Word. They say it is only a human product. It has no more value than Aesop's fables or perhaps Shakespeare. They would say it only becomes God's word to you when God speaks to you in a particular way in a verse or in a section of Scripture. But then they would say Shakespeare becomes God's word to you as well when it speaks to you in a certain way. Now, these are easy to identify. We don't have any trouble identifying these. So they're not that dangerous, particularly to us who know the Scriptures. But there's a second way of disbelieving God's Word that's more dangerous. And that is they reject the Bible's sole authority. They reject the Bible as being the only 
authoritative Word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and life. They say, oh yes, we believe the Bible is God's Word, but then they come alongside the Bible and they want to elevate another source to either be equal or superior to the authority of Scripture. And where they can deceive us is because they say, oh yeah, we believe the Bible. I believe the Bible is God's Word. But what they don't tell us is they believe other words are just as inspired or more so than the Bible. For example, the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon believes that the Book of Mormon is equal with the Bible. They say, yes, we believe the Bible, but they also believe the Book of Mormon, and they believe it is equally inspired to the Bible. Another example would be the words of the Pope, the Roman Catholic Pope, when he speaks ex cathedra. Now, ex cathedra means he speaks officially from the chair. And so the Roman Catholic Church teaches that when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, his words are infallible and are as inspired by God as the Bible itself. Now let me give you an example of just such a statement by a Pope, and this is Pope Pius XII. And this is the statement. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own authority, we pronounce, declare, and define it to be a divinely revealed dogma. And here it comes. This is the divine, divinely revealed dogma. Here it is. Equal with Scripture and the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church that the Immaculate Mother of God, the ever-Virgin Mary, having completed the course of her earthly life, was assumed body and soul into heavenly glory. In other words, Mary didn't die. She joined Enoch and Elijah as one who was taken up straight into heaven. You say, well, preacher, where does the Bible say that? It doesn't, obviously. So, but teaching of the Roman Catholic Church is that those words about Mary are just as true and inspired and divine as this book. And so there are those who disbelieve the Word of God because they rejected soul authority. Kenneth Copeland does this as well. Kenneth Copeland says that God said to him that the truth was that I never, Jesus said, I never claimed to be God. In this book, Jesus said, the Father and I are one. Now, for me to stand up before you and tell you Jesus told me he never claimed to be God is for me to tell you that I have revelation that exceeds this revelation. A third way that false teachers disbelieve the Word of God is that they twist the meaning of it. Now let me go back for a moment to the one before. Now, remember what Jude said, the faith once and for all handed down to the saints? That once and for all means it was completed. When this book, the 66 books of the Bible, were completed, that was it. No more divinely inspired, infallible revelation of God. 
And yet what we have is those claiming to be receiving new revelation from God. That God is speaking to me and telling me new things. The scripture says, once for all, delivered, handed down to the saints. Now let's get back to the twisting. This is the most dangerous, I believe, of all of these ways of disbelieving God's word. Because they twist the meaning of God's word to change what it really means. They say, oh yes, we believe the Bible. We believe it is God's Word. But they reject it by so twisting the meaning of it till it says totally different from what God meant for it to say. They reinterpret the Word of God until it doesn't say anything like it originally said. For example, in interpreting John 1, 12 and 13, where the scripture says, And as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Now, Kenneth Copeland takes that verse and twists the meaning of it to say that God begets God. You are little gods. He says dogs beget dogs. Cats beget cats. Well, what does God beget? Gods. So you are a little God. Now, that is a total perversion of the meaning of this passage. Another twisting is found over in Isaiah chapter 40. In Isaiah chapter 40, God says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span? Kenneth Copeland takes that verse and says this. God is very much like you and me. A being that stands somewhere between 6'2 and 6'3. That weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred pounds. A little better. And has a hand span nine inches across. Now, that is a total twisting of that passage to mean what it never was intended to mean. The Mormon church does the same thing with the virgin birth of Jesus. In Luke chapter 1 verse 35, we read, the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the child will be called the Son of God. They say that God the Father came in flesh and bones like a regular man and had relations with Mary. Now that is a total perversion and twisting of that scripture. And so there is a disbelieving of God's word by not only outright rejecting it, not only by placing other sources as equal or above scripture in authority, but there is such a twisting of the meaning of the passage that it doesn't even mean at all what it originally meant. But there is a fourth way they disbelieve God's word, and that is they deny that Jesus is the only Master, Lord, and Savior. Now I think it's interesting that John talks about this as well. When he talks about the importance of testing the spirits, not just to believe every spirit, but you need to test the spirits. And John tells us how to test the spirit of a teaching, of a teacher, of a prophet. 
And look what he says. 1 John 4. He says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. He tells us how to know it. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist. John says that every false teacher will deny the deity of Jesus Christ, that he was totally God, totally man. They will deny that he is God come in the flesh, that he is the second person of the Trinity, co-equal, co-eternal with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And so when you're judging teachers, you go and you find out what they truly believe about Jesus Christ. And if they deny Him as God in the flesh, as the Master and Lord in Christ, then you have your answer. Liberals reject Jesus as God. They say He was only a man. He wasn't God. Mormons reject Jesus as the only begotten Son of God. They say that you and I can be as much God as Jesus. Jesus is just ahead of the process. They say as God, as we are, God once was. As God is, we once shall be. What they mean by that? They meant God walked the earth one day just like us. Okay, But he was so good and followed the teachings so well that when he died, he got promoted to Godhead. And he got given a planet. And the planet he was given was earth. And so he's our God now. But if you men live right, sorry women, you can't be gods. But if you men live right, but you can marry one and that helps. If you men live right, then one day you'll get to have your own planet. And you can be God of that planet. They say that Jesus and Lucifer are brothers. They deny Jesus as God come in the flesh uniquely, the only begotten Son of God. Jehovah Witnesses reject Jesus as being one essence with God the Father. They say there are two gods. Jesus is God, but He's not equal to to Jehovah God. Jehovah God is supreme, so they deny that. Kenneth Copeland denies that Jesus was fully God and fully man. He says, Why didn't Jesus openly proclaim Himself as God during his 33 years on earth. One simple reason. He hadn't come to earth as God. He'd come as man. Joyce Meyer also does not believe that Jesus is totally, fully God. She says, Jesus stopped being the Son of God. He could have helped himself up until the point where he said, I commend my spirit into your hands. He's talking about when he was on the cross. At that point, he couldn't, now these are her her words, he couldn't do nothing for himself anymore. He had become sin. He was no longer the son of God. He was sin. Now the church has rejected that heresy. And it's not new. It's a heresy that goes all the way back to the first and second and third centuries. But the church has rejected that heresy ever since then. Creflo Dollar, Creflo Dollar says, Jesus didn't come as God. He came as a man. And he did not come perfect. Jude says, they deny the only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the first characteristic of false teachers, they disbelieve the Word of God. Second, they resist proper authority. When he says that they have crept in unnoticed, he is speaking about their deceit and their rejection of proper authorities. 
That word crep has the idea of deceit and trickery. It means to circumvent recognized authorities by trickery and deceit. In fact, in secular writings, this word was used to speak of a criminal that had been exiled from a country sneaking back into the country. It's like your children sneaking out at night, your teenagers sneaking out at night. He's circumventing your authority. He is resisting and rejecting your authority by his trickery and his deceit. So false teachers, Jude says, are slipping into the church under the guise of being bona fide teachers of truth. But yet, they pretend to believe God's word, therefore they're going unnoticed, and they're resisting church authorities by their deceit. If they were outright straightforward, the church authorities would say, you're not teaching in here, be gone. Notice also, Jude calls them, he says they are ungodly persons. Now that word ungodly means lacking reverence for God. These false teachers reject God's authority by rejecting those delegated authorities he's placed over them, but also by showing a lack of reverence and respect and awe for God. Now, they may talk about how much they love God, but they do not have an awesome reverence for God. How could Jimmy Swaggart have a holy awe and fear of God and continue to preach while at the same time committing acts of impurity and sensuality with prostitutes? At the same time, he was preaching. He couldn't. We see his rejection of proper authorities when... The Church of God Assembly said he must step down for two years. He stepped down for two months, and he decided he'd go back. After he said, I'll submit to whatever the church leaders say I need to do, they said, you need to step down for two years and be restored. Two months, that's enough. So there's this rejection of authority. Fred Price shows his lack of reverence and fear for God when he says... Man is the only creation of God that's in God's class. God has made man a God. But yet, what does God say? For I am God, and there is no other. For I am God, and there is no one like me. T.D. Jakes shows a lack of reverence and awe for God when he says this. When God created Adam, he created him from the dust of the earth. God put his mouth on him, blew in him the breath of life. He became a living soul. God said, I wanted to see what I looked like. So I made you to be my image. You have my DNA. You're created out of me. You're a derivative of me. God created me so he could see what he looked like? The Bible says God is spirit. You don't have a body like I have. Lack of reverence and respect for God. Kenneth Copeland, showing his lack of reverence for God, said these words. You're all God. You don't have a God living in you. You are one. When I read in the Bible where God tells Moses, I am, I say, yeah, I am too. That is blasphemy. And so there is this lack of awe and reverence for a holy God. And in so doing, there is a rejection of his authority and the authorities of those he's placed over us. So we have two characteristics of false teachers. They disbelieve the word of God. They reject proper authorities, showing a lack of reverence and awe for God. There's a third characteristic. They indulge their fleshly desires. There is a self-indulgence 
among false teachers, not a self-denial. They say, Jude says, they have turned the grace of God into licentiousness. Now, that's not a word we use too much, so I want to explain to you what licentiousness means. It does sound bad, doesn't it? It is an insatiable desire for pleasure. They have turned the grace of God into an insatiable desire to fulfill their fleshly pleasures. Rather than growing into holiness, they are growing into self-gratification of their fleshly desires. When Jesus says, If any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, they would say, Jesus is saying, if any man desires to come out to me, let him indulge himself and follow me. It means excessive pleasure, insatiable desire for pleasure, self-indulgence, sensuality. It's the absence of restraint. It is lustfulness. Now, this self-indulgence can take many different forms. It can be immorality. It can be greed. It can be self-exaltation. It can be materialism. It can be impurity. <clears throat> it can be sensuality. <clears throat> but Jesus says, If any man desires to come out to me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now that's the call of a disciple. Every Christian. I would say particularly those who are ministers of the gospel. As we look at the New Testament, Jesus himself, Paul, Peter, the other leaders, we don't see extravagance as their lifestyle. We don't see them indulging their fleshly desire. Now, I admit, I don't exactly know everything it means by deny yourself. I don't think preachers need to be poor. I don't think anything godly about that. I think it's okay for them to have a decent life. I think that's fine. But I have a hard time reconciling denying oneself with Joel Osteen having a $10 million mansion. I really do. I, I just can't figure out how the denying oneself fits into that. Oh, but he, he's written many books and, and, and he, and he has, draws all these crowds and they buy tickets and he makes all this money. Well, yeah. But where does deny yourself come in? Why not use that money to spread the gospel, to support missionaries and ministries? Benny Hinn has an extravagant lifestyle, extravagant spending. One of the television networks did an expose on him several years ago, and they found out that between his Crusades, he often stops off at resorts for rest time. They found that when he was in Montreal, he was staying at the Royal Suite at the St. James Hotel. The cost of a room was $2,700 a night. When he was in London, the hotel he stayed at, the price of a room per night was $3,124. He stayed in Milan at the largest hotel suite in Europe, over 5,000 square feet, which is larger than our homes, and at a price tag of $10,800 a night. Now, I have a hard time squaring that away with, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He also lives in a mansion that's valued at $10 million. 
dollars. It's called the ministry parsonage. I've lived in some parsonages in my life, but never one like that. Ten million dollars. He has a private jet that costs him $112,000 a month. So the third earmark is they indulge fleshly desires. We are called on, as Christians, to judge the teachers that we sit under, that we listen to. If we're going to earnestly contend for the faith, we must put them to the test. Put me to the test. You should. Put your Sunday school teacher to the test. You should. But you should also put to the test those that you read, those that you listen to on the radio, those that you listen to on the television, because you're placing yourself under their teaching. Do they disbelieve God's Word? Do they reject proper authority? Do they indulge fleshly desires? Now here's where you go. Do they disbelieve God's word? Are they rejecting it as the sole authority? Are they twisting the meaning of Scripture? Do they deny Jesus as God come in the flesh? Find that out. That's what it means to contend earnestly for the faith. You've got to do some digging. Now, I admit, that's part of the problem with these television and radio guys is that you're not exposed to them. Now, you're exposed to me. You know if I drive a Mercedes or if I drive a Bentley or if I drive a Rolls Royce. You'll know that if I pull up in that, won't you? You'll know if I pull up in a Hyundai too, won't you? You'll know if I wear $800 suits or if I get my clothes at Walmart or somewhere else. You'll know that. You'll know if my family lives right or if my wife and I have a good marriage. You won't know that about these TV guys. You, you're, not, you're not able to look into their lives, and that's, again, part of the danger. You don't rub shoulders with them on a weekly basis. It makes it more difficult, but nevertheless, we must contend for the faith. Do they resist proper authority? Are they showing a lack of reverence for God in their teaching and in their life? And look at their lifestyle. Is it extravagant? Is it showing a life of self-denial or self-indulgence? Ask those questions. Because God has commanded you and me to contend earnestly for the faith. And that means we've got to identify the false teachers. Will you do that? I've given you a couple of websites that you can take a look at that will help you in this endeavor. Uh, that slide will stay up here for a few moments, and you can jot down that uh, web address. But these will help you in finding out the different teachings of these different people that you're listening to on radio and television. But we must contend for the faith. Let's pray. We do welcome you, and I'm glad that you have taken the opportunity to listen to a sermon on our Internet and I want you just to know that uh, everybody in the church is not like me. Uh, I have these fellows up here, our leadership team. Uh, this is Filiberto Medina, who is our Hispanic pastor. And our Hispanic congregation meets every Sunday evening at 6.30. This is Paul Kumar. He is our minister of community connections. Uh, and to my left is Mark Baker, who heads up our Reformers Unanimous Ministry, which is a Christian addiction recovery program that meets every Friday night at 7 o'clock. So if you live in the Mableton area, uh, and it doesn't matter what race you're from, it doesn't matter your cultural background, I want you to know you are welcome at Westside Church. This is where everybody is somebody and Jesus is Lord. Hope you'll join us soon. Thank you for being with us for this message. Each week, Dr. Stewart gives practical applications and ways to live out the Word of God. If you would like more information, please take a moment to view our website at wbcfamily.org. That's wbcfamily.org.